Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation and for the symposium. So I have to be very careful because I see that uh, if I, there are mistakes in the slides, they will be uh, noticed. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, great. So, um, um, so I've been working in a number uh, of companies for uh, collaboration and uh, research. Uh, so let's go back to this issue of uh, what is the effect of the support we give uh, on the diaphragm. So this is a, a schematic representation of the load and uh, what the ventilator can do and what the uh, muscles can do. So here would be control mechanical ventilation. So all the load is taken by the ventilator, so the respiratory muscles are completely at rest, and uh, we heard that this may not be very good. And during partial ventilatory support, uh, we hope that uh, both the ventilator and the respiratory muscle are taking some part of the load. But it is uh, quite uh, easy to have an inadequate setting, and in fact to have either uh, let, let's say this is two opposite examples of inappropriate assistance, either an excessive load with the respiratory muscle of the patients, or even an excessive unloading because the level of assistance by the ventilator is, is too high. Uh, so we are talking a lot of uh, ventilator-induced diaphragm dysfunction and atrophy. Uh, this is not a new topic. and. Uh, I think like, uh, like Vili, it, it, this is something which takes years in, before coming into practice. This was probably the first uh, human data suggesting uh, in, in uh, infants that uh, there could be a diaphragm atrophy induced by uh, mechanical ventilation. Uh, this was a case uh, uh, presentation, so not completely convincing. Uh, there has been a lot of animal data, and you know that now we have clinical data uh, showing in maybe special situation that the diaphragm can atrophy, and uh, you probably have seen this slide before, uh, where after 24 hours of mechanical ventilation or a bit more, you see clearly on, on the biopsy for the same scale that the fibers uh, have a smaller diameter, so there is what we call a disuse atrophy of the respiratory muscles. Um, and the animal uh, literature is, is full of data showing that mechanical ventilation is a very good model. And there are some uh, uh, mechanisms at, at play which, which have been studied, for instance, in this study by Catherine Sassoon in rabbits uh, submitted to uh, 48 hours of mechanical ventilation, and you see a big difference between control and uh, uh, the control animals and control mechanical ventilation. What was very interesting and attractive for us clinicians was to say, well, if you use some kind of assisted ventilation, which means the animals are triggering, are breathing a little bit, uh, there is much less signal, so there is much less disuse atrophy. So maybe most of us say, well, this is good, so maybe we don't have to worry so much about what, what's happening in our ICU because we often use uh, assisted ventilation. However, other ex, uh, experiments show that, uh, well, okay, but it's not because you use an assisted mode that you prevent this atrophy. And the, the, this paper was saying that high level of pressure support, here it's 18 centimeters of water of pressure support, it's similar to uh, control mechanical ventilation in inducing atrophy. Oh, so we go back and say, maybe it's not because we use pressure support in many of our patients that we prevent this atrophy. So we, we need clinical data. And uh, one way to look at atrophy in the clinical setting is to directly look at the morphology of the muscle. And the diaphragm ultrasound is a very interesting technique uh, because with, with uh, 
some precaution, you can uh, detect the diaphragm between the two layers of the pleural and the peritoneum layer. And the, what is in between these two layers is the muscle, the diaphragm contracting. So you can, in M mode, measure the thickness of the diaphragm. And you can even measure the thickening of the diaphragm at each inspiration. As you know, when the muscle contracts, it thickens and it shortens. And this tool uh, has been uh, now uh, used in a number of studies um, to detect the change in thickness. And this was a study done in Toronto by Yuan Oliger on uh, uh, more than 100 patients uh, just ventilated for 20, 24 hours or, or more and looking uh, prospectively daily at the diaphragm thickness and also at the diaphragm thickening, which means how much the patients are using their muscle. And what you see looks complex, but in fact is, uh, sorry, is, I do the same trick. So it is, um, uh, in fact, easy to understand. What you have here is the change in diaphragm thickness. And you see that for many patients, over the duration of ventilation, there is a decrease in thickness. And we think that uh, when it's higher than 10%, it's, it's significant because this is the, the limit of reproducibility of the technique. And approximately 40%, 4 0, 40% of the patients develop decrease in thickness. So let's say develop atrophy. That's huge. That's not, that's not one, two percent, that's 40 percent. And this was clearly related to the duration of mechanical ventilation. And of course, if you, now if you look in this way, it's also related to the contractile activity, which means for the patients who are doing very little work, for instance, let's say high level of pressure support, there was a much faster decrease in the thickening. So we don't only have one factor, which is time, on which we, we cannot play a lot. We also have a factor on which maybe we can play, which is how much diaphragm activity the patient is performing each day. Well, you may say, but the, 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 uh, the figure is more complex because we even see uh, some patient with an increase in thickness. Well, wow, that was fascinating. We thought maybe that's good. The muscle is, is, uh, is getting better. But we think that's probably not getting better, more fibers. That's probably getting more uh, edema or injury. And in fact, the patients who had an increase in thickness were the patients who were working harder. Well, and that was approximately 15% of the patient. So if you don't give enough assist, there will be injury to the muscle. And if you give too much assist, there will be atrophy. Well, that's a very difficult uh, job for the clinician. Uh, you could say, OK, you show diaphragm atrophy. You show diaphragm increase in thickness. Does it matter? Uh, and that's a. Uh, a difficult and important question because if we want to change our practice we have to show that it has an influence. Uh, this was a study looking at the level of uh, phrenic nerve stimulation, the twitch, the pressure generated by phrenic nerve stimulation in controlled subject in patient with absolutely no diaphragmatic dysfunction tested by voluntary maneuver, so which means their maximum pressure was high, and in patient with diaphragm dysfunction. And you see that there's a very clear separation with the phrenic nerve stimulation technique. And when the twitch is at 11 centimeters of water or below, it's a clear sign of uh, diaphragm dysfunction. So that's an interesting test because you don't need the uh, contribution of the patient, you don't need the cooperation of the patient, and you can do that in, in uh, ventilated patients. And this technique was used by Martin Dress in Paris uh, to address the question 
uh, he, he addressed, let's say, three questions. The first question was, is diaphragm dysfunction frequent at the time when we start weaning from mechanical ventilations? Uh, this is medical patients, so in a medical ICU. And he said, let's look at how many patients have a twitch pressure, which is 11 or below, so that this is clear dysfunction. How many patients have a normal twitch pressure? And the first uh, answer here is that 60% of the patients have diaphragm dysfunction. That's very interesting because if you remember the 40% who had the decrease in thickness plus the 15% who have uh, an increase in thickness, uh, that's approximately the same percentage, 60%. The second question he, he, he asked was, is it the same disease or syndrome than limb muscle weakness, the you know, classical ICU-acquired uh, neuropathy? And that's why he plotted the sweet treat pressure versus the MRC score. And he found that, well, there is some overlaps here. So some patients who have a low MRC score and a lo uh, low twitch pressure but you have much more patients who have normal MRC score, but still have diaphragm dysfunction. So the answer is clear. No, it is not the same disease. There is some overlap, but it's an independent mechanism. And it's probably, probably, we don't know here, it's, it's frequently related to mechanical ventilation. So the third question he addressed is, does this impact the winning success or failure? And, and the answer is yes. There is a, a very large impact. This is two way to, sorry, whoops, to present it. Um, so this is the three categories of winning. Let's say simple, difficult, and prolonged winning. And you see that this is the prevalence of diaphragm dysfunction in simple winning, in difficult winning, and prolonged winning. Well, in Interesting to note, uh, you may have diaphragm dysfunction, but still be able to win, right? You're, you're still breathing. If you have no other problem, you, it will be okay. So there is only 60% of patients in simple winning who have no diaphragm dysfunction. The other do. But if you have difficult or prolonged winning, it's almost 100%. So there is a very, very strong association suggesting a very strong impact on diaphragm dysfunction at the time of winning and further winning difficulties. And that's the same for duration of winning, duration of mechanical ventilation, etc. cetera. Uh, and uh, more than that, this is a study we did uh, in Geneva following patients who were admitted with hypercapnic respiratory failure uh, and following the patient after discharge. And you know that in the hypercapnic patient, one of the big problems is readmission. And we found that uh, using a different technique, which is the, the, the sniff evaluation of uh, the, the diaphragm, uh, those patients having muscle dysfunction had a much more frequent rate of hospital readmission and ICU readmission. So it's not only a, a problem for the ICU stay, but it's also a problem for what will happen after ICU discharge. Uh, and there is an additional problem that it's not only the quantity of uh, work, but it's also the synchrony between patient and ventilator. There are a number of studies uh, showing association between interaction and, uh, and um, duration of mechanical ventilation, poor ventilator interaction and uh, duration of ventilation. There is one study by Louis Blanc who showed an association with mortality. And the most recent study comes from uh, Dimitris Georgopoulos and his group. And they looked at patients who develop what they called clusters of asynchrony. And uh, a cluster of asynchrony was uh, here, like, this is a time scale, and was defined as having at least, uh, let's say, 50% of the breaths which are asynchronous over a three minute period. And he found that was the most uh, informative uh, predictor of bad outcome. Uh, you see patients who develop uh, clusters of asynchrony, 
uh, have clearly a longer ICU stay, longer duration of mechanical ventilation in total or after the uh, event. So, so more and more data associating desynchrony, asynchrony, and uh, a poor outcome. Uh, so how can we monitor? So I agree with uh, Giacomo, the reference technique to monitor the respiratory muscle is uh, esophageal pressure. And I just put here the tracings you obtain in control mechanical ventilation up, so the, the pressure goes up during each breath, and during spontaneous ventilation. In fact, when you want to measure the muscular pressure, ideally you should make the, calculate the difference between the two. So this is a very beautiful technique. This is a reference technique, but I agree this is complicated. And uh, monitoring the diaphragm EMG may be a, an easy technique to do that. Uh, this is a nice example because you have uh, pressure support ventilation, which looks very regular and, and very nice with a respiratory rate of 18. So if you already have uh, a good I, you see that these small changes in airway pressure and flow may be something else. And in fact, when you have the diaphragm EMG, you realize that uh, there were two missing breaths here. So in fact, the real patient respiratory rate is probably more than 30, 30 to 35. And, and this is an example if it's over, let's say, three minutes, that would be a cluster of asynchrony. So very concerning. Uh, this is another example where, again, you can recognize maybe this ineffective effort, which indeed correspond to diaphragm activity. It may be much more difficult to recognize this one or this one, which is picked up very nicely by diaphragm activity. So to really monitor uh, the uh, real activity of the diaphragm, that, that may be a, um, an interesting tool. Uh, we showed in a recent study that uh, it's possible to uh, improve even pressure support ventilation by using uh, the electrical activity of the diaphragm. And we showed, for instance, that we could uh, reduce the trigger delay or the, um, the time in excess after the end of the breath. Uh, a last interesting tool with EDI, and I'll finish in my time of I'm in the red, I see now, uh, is that uh, you can even monitor the respiratory muscle activity when there is no respiratory muscle activity. What do you mean? Well, I mean, if you place the catheter correctly, and placement of the catheter is mostly based on the ECG tracing, you, you see, uh, you can detect exactly when the patient starts to use his or her respiratory muscle, and when the patients start to really breathe spontaneously, because we saw in all the study that the initial period of uh, 24 or 48 hours is critical. And in fact, probably this is the period where we say, well, it doesn't matter too much. And when uh, Leo Hanks was with us in, uh, uh, in Toronto, we decided to launch a study to look at every intubated patient, to put a NAVA catheter at that time, not to do NAVA, but just to monitor the EMG uh, uh, and to know when the patient would start to uh, be uh, activating a respiratory muscle. Um, so, oops. So this is an example, the patient at day first, this is a placement of the esophageal catheter. You see no diaphragm activity, and you see that uh, patient has no EDI. So this is the trend over the first 24 hours. You see no activity or very, very low activity, uh, below five microvolts, for instance. It never reaches five microvolts, which, which would be the minimal level of respiratory muscle activity. On day two, uh, still uh, no activity, the patient is still sedated and uh, has opioids. So classical patient uh, admitted for acute respiratory failure. On day three, propofen has been stopped, the patient is still on uh, some opioid infusion. Uh, you see some uh, weird uh, tracing, which probably uh, have been recognized by some of you as being reverse triggering. Uh, so this is why the uh, uh, the EDI peak is, is increasing. On day four, it's still some reverse triggering. Uh, 
And it's only on day five that these patients started to have, a, let's say, normal respiratory muscle activity. So we say, well, we, we do not uh, worry too much about the first initial hours and mechanical ventilation. Well, it can take five, six days very easily, and that will be a patient very likely who will have uh, diaphragm atrophy and uh, winning difficulties. So we are continuing these studies. This was the result of the first initial 15 patients. We are close to have 80 patients. And thanks to uh, the whole team uh, in our group in, uh, in Toronto, uh, our research fellow and respiratory therapist, we are close to achieve our goal. So in conclusion, uh, uh, I would reinforce the message given by uh, uh, speakers before me. I think monitoring diaphragm activity, diaphragm function, and patient ventilator synchrony uh, is going to be key in the future, and we need tools like uh, esophageal pressure or electrical activity to do that. Thank you very much.